you want this deadline. Yeah. So this lecture will kind of pick up on some of the issues uh, covered in uh, some of the last ones, particularly to do with literacy and numeracy, where you can kind of imagine that there is some kind of innate starting point, but actually a lot of what it is is kind of learnt or embedded within culture. And this comes down to one of the, the things that actually drew uh, a lot of people into psychology. I don't know whether you were kind of interested in uh, doing a psychology degree because of this question, but it's one of those things that kind of really captures the imagination. That's the, the nature nurture debate. Um, whereas the way that it, it's kind of thought is that the extent to which cognition behavior can be attributed to genes, what we would call kind of nature, or environment, which is what we call nurture. The, the environment here is, is, um, should be kind of understood more broadly than I think a lot of kind of certainly first year psychologists understand it, that the environment isn't just the way that your mum and dad treat you, it's kind of everything that isn't in your genes basically. So this would include things like you know, diseases and so on, that is your environment even though it's very much your biological environment as well as your social environment. So it covers uh, both of those. Uh, kinds of factors, things that happen to you in your womb, for instance, what your mother eats in your womb, it's biological, but that is your environment, it's not your genes, okay? Um, and really, the, the pendulum has always kind of swung backwards and forwards, uh, you know, over time, so Galton was the person who argued that, you know, nature's very important, he, he coined the term nature and nurture uh, in the 19th century, he looked at kind of uh, genius and intelligence and notice that some families seem to have more of it and others don't. But obviously that was kind of in a, a culture in which some people were highly educated and others weren't, for instance, you know, and there weren't the methods for people in those parts. Uh, and then on the nurture side, you've got people like Freud who emphasizes early experience, Vygotsky, uh, and then behaviorism and, and so on. And of course most kind of modern essays these days end, end up concluding, well, it's a bit of nature and a bit of nurture. And that's perfectly true, but really what I want you to think about in this lecture is, what, well, it is true, but that's just a description. What does it actually mean to be a bit of nature and a bit of nurture? And, and the real interesting thing isn't just describing in this way, it's kind of explaining it, explaining how nurture and nature and nurture kind of have an influence, why it's sometimes one and, and not the other, and how the two kind of interact. And really that is the cutting edge of, of this, and this is kind of how cognitive neuroscience can uh, Impact. So th there is a kind of a middle ground between this kind of pendulum of nature and nurture. Uh, and really, th the idea here is that the, the brain isn't, although the brain is kind of your biology, uh, and you, you, you might think of your brain as being kind of the, the complete nature side of the equation rather than nurture, that that's in itself is a fallacy, that your brain is nurtured by your environment and your experiences and so on. So even with animal studies of kind of, you know, mice in enriched environments or kind of given lots of family support with their uh, other mice and so that their brains develop in different ways than mice uh, re re in isolation with no toys to play on and so on. So that's environment, but the outcome there is biology. So the brain isn't just the nature side of the equation. Yet if your genes are important for creating the brain, but the brain is the thing that, you know, dictates your habits, your cultural tendencies, you know, the way you think, uh, and, and so on. And Piaget kind of was somebody who trod this middle ground between the others. So he, he argued that basically that you, you have kind of got uh, uh, an innate aspect, and he imagined development going through a cycle of kind of stages where, uh, in effect, your, your genes and your nature kind of set up a stage of development but then you need your environmental inputs in order to progress to the next stage. Uh, so you've got this cyclical kind of interaction that your nature sets things up, but in order to develop, you then need appropriate inputs in the environment, and then the brain matures in another way, and you need another set of development. This was his way of thinking about uh, nature and nurture. <coughs> so uh, in his view, the genes were kind of uh, setting up a brain that's ready to learn in certain ways, but you still need certain kinds of mechanisms. And often in kind of the cognitive neuroscience literature, there, there's a group of people called neuroconstructivism, and basically this is this kind of Piaget's idea, but kind of grounded more in neuroscience, the idea uh, that, that basically you're kind of constructing things, but you're given certain building blocks to begin with.
Uh, so here, these are just two different views of development. This is your kind of year one psychology understanding of, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, the brain and nature. And this is your uh, year three uh, understanding here, which is kind of the mature way uh, of thinking about it. So perhaps before you thought that, that really uh, you've got effectively predetermined development, the genes are the things that you're born with you can't change. And so the genes dictate your brain structure. The way your structure's brain determines how you function, how you function determines the kinds of experiences you have. Okay? And uh, this is perfectly true, but what I, you kind of need to realize uh, you know, as you require more knowledge, it's that the reverse is also true. The experiences you have affects the way that your brain functions. The way your brain functions affects the way it's structured, and the way it's structured goes right back down to switching genes on in the brain. It can't change the structure of your genetic code, but it can influence the way that the genes actually operate uh, in the brain. So it's not causing mutations, it's affecting the way that the, the, the genes uh, are played out. Um, okay. So I'm just seeing where I'm going. With this. Uh, okay, I haven't got the graph. But anyway, so one good example of this, and there's various other ones here, uh, is that there's uh, an MRI study. So this is MRI that looks at structural uh, differences in the brain. So not fMRI, which is measuring blood flow. Here it's measuring the amount of grey matter and white matter in each little part of the brain. And what they do is they took a group of only 12 people and taught them how to juggle in three months. So they would have all these kind of juggling practices and so on. And what they found is that um, the, between time one of not being a juggler and time two, three months later of juggling, that they actually literally grow parts of their brain. And these were parts of the brain involved in detecting visual motion and involved in kind of hand-eye coordination in the, in the ventral stream. So literally, there was more uh, gray matter in terms of uh, the, the amount of volume in three months. Then they stop juggling, and you find that the amount of gray matter goes down, but not to the initial level. It might do eventually, it, nobody knows the exact time course. So here you've got experience, learning a skill, affecting your brain functioning, your, your behavior, your ability to catch three or four balls in the air, affecting your brain structure that can be measured at a millimeter level, not just at the level of synapses. And here, the, the mechanism is unknown, but the idea is that you're switching on genes that lead to the creation of new synapses and new connections. Those synapses lead to more volume in that part of the brain. And we've got exactly the same thing from learning to drive a taxi, if you remember. Uh, people are looking at how genes get switched on from learning and memory here. But the idea is that learning your way around London kind of affects the way that your brain functions the, and the structure of the brain, the size of your hippocampus, and that is at least partly determined by switching on uh, certain genes in the hippocampus which cause neurons to grow. So you've got this backwards flow as well as forwards flow. And this is the, the, the kind of exciting thing, is this, this kind of backwards flow. So if we talk about the kind of forwards flow to begin with, how genes kind of create this. So, so, the brain develops kind of in the womb through rapid cell division, and then uh, cells get assigned to become neurons or support cells or, or whatever. And the brain's kind of created by forming these kind of ball of cells and then pushing them into place, either passively that they kind of just get pushed to the edge of certain structures, or that they're carried uh, along certain uh, tubules, which kind of get them uh, into their destination. Uh, and you can kind of see um, here that you know various things come into place. You've got this tube, and then it kind of grows, and then you've got the kind of folds, uh, and so on. Here, um, one of the things that you actually find is that at nine months, you pretty much got all the neurons that, that you will ever have. It was once thought that you can't grow new neurons. That's actually not the case. There, there's certainly some parts of the brain, what's called the dentate gyrus around the campus, where you can grow new neurons. Uh, but, uh, but by and large, um, the, the numbers are small, and it's certainly not found throughout the brain, but you are kind of born with your complements of neurons. You might wonder, well, what's going on in the infant's head? Why does its head get bigger? And basically, it's the other kinds of cells in the head that, that, that are, are growing, but still, um, that, that do that. And there's obviously a, a pressure not to have a too big a head, otherwise you're not going to pop out. So that's a, so. One thing is the number of neurons is pretty much in place, 
The other thing is not the number of neurons, but the actual connections between them. And basically, at birth, you've got the more, most kind of connections in your brain than you would ever have at any other uh, time in your life. Uh, so here, what you, or soon after birth, so this is the age uh, from conception. This is the number of synapses in a given uh, little volume of the brain uh, here. This is humans. But you get, well, yes, it must be human. Uh, and what you've got here is different kinds of rates of uh, drop-off of kind of maturation there. So what you find in the, if you look at the green one, is that your visual cortex kind of peaks uh, you know, within, um, so, but, so here within, uh, so 500 days after conception, so yeah, when you're, you know, a, a few months old uh, with that, you then got the most synapses in your visual cortex than you will ever have, even though you're, you're not used to the experience. The auditory cortex drops off in the first uh, few years, and then the, one of the last regions to mature is your frontal lobes which doesn't re reach adult levels until adolescence. And the idea here is that this, uh, it stops, uh, one of the things that stops children from being independent, it kind of keeps them with their parents, ensures a kind of a long period of learning. So humans, as well as having unusually uh, large brains for their size, they also have a very long developmental uh, process uh, for, for reaching adulthood. And one of the reasons for that is that they uh, is the giving birth to a large brain, you have to do it uh, outside rather than inside, if you will, because your head uh, can't pop out. Uh, and and the, the other reason is the idea of a social learning and kind of a cultural education, that if your children leave home at the age of one or whatever, then the chances of learning from each other, this kind of socialization isn't, uh, the opportunities for that are diminished. Uh, but your frontal lobes kind of kick in last, and this is to do with kind of more complex self-decision-making. Um, yeah, well, what else was there to say about it? So why, why is it that, um, that, that it's decreasing like this? Well, for one thing, it, it's, um, it's not necessarily clear that the more connections you have in the brain, the more efficient it is. Uh, so it might be that by reducing connections, you're effectively getting rid of noise, by which I mean neural noise, so kind of random firings, random patterns, and you're kind of tuning in to things in your environment. So for instance, learning the phonemes in your language and not somebody else's language, you're effectively having to tune things out. But that mean, the idea behind that is that you can process things more efficiently. So the idea is that this involves, uh, you know, kind of tuning into the things in your environment that are important. Uh, <coughs> um, The other thing that kind of relates to this is the idea that there are certain periods in which you might need to be kind of exposed to things in your environment in order for efficient learning to take place. And in the literature, this is what was once called critical periods, that you need a stimulus to be uh, present in order to kind of learn that. And now, people talk about sensitive periods. So uh, the idea of a sensitive period is that a window doesn't close completely. It can kind of be uh, kept open. So one good example of this is um, that newborn chicks uh, follow the first moving object that they see. And it's almost that they mistake that for being their mother, uh, and so on. Uh, but the, the idea is that there's a key time window in which this uh, takes place. Uh, that if they're not exposed to a suitable stimulus, then they don't show it later when they start to see something move. What you, <coughs> what you tend to find, though, is that uh, that if, when a chick sees uh, an object moving, uh, it will kind of imprint that, and then it won't then learn another one. So if it sees the experimenter waving something around like this, it will treat that as if it's its mother. But then when the mother comes along, it can't relearn that after the first month. So it's almost if like the window closes when, uh, when the stimulus arrives. But what happens if it doesn't see its mother for a few days? that what happens there is that that time window kind of extends until the input appears. Uh, but if it never, you know, but only up until a certain point. So, um, so most, the window kind of closes within a day because it sees its mother and it says, I found the thing I'm looking for, and it stops it forming attachment to other things. 
But if it doesn't see its mother, then that one day window will extend a bit, but not indefinitely. So it suggests here that you've got some kind of innate window, but the time course of that window is determined by the environment when you see your mother, okay? Or when you see the moving object that is likely to be your mother uh, uh, with that. So again, there's an element of flexibility and there's an element, a key element of kind of nature versus nurture. The brain is set up to expect some things and then when it receives it, it kind of then responds to it in particular ways. So a very simple example. Uh, and you see similar things in, um, in vision as well. So, um, so remember that, you know, soon after birth, this is when you've got your most kind of synapses. And the neurons carry on developing in, in vision, even if, um, even if the, there isn't any light, they still c carry on maturing up until a certain uh, time point. And then afterwards, uh, th they don't uh, do that, or they only respond to the, the eye, which you can see is difficult. So let me, I'll come back to the other slides here. So this is, um, what you've got here is the visual cortex, and what you find is regions of visual cortex that respond to different orientations. Uh, so here, coloured in yellow, it means that the, the cells in this region respond to lines that are oriented like this. It's not to do with colour, colour's just a way of depicting it. Whereas uh, ones in blue here respond to lines of this orientation. Okay. So what you find <coughs> uh, within two weeks after birth, this is in cats, is that you find cells tuned to that, but there's no real patterning uh, in the system. There's no, they don't kind of group together or kind of have this particular structure. Then what you find is that uh, at three weeks, they start to kind of coalesce. You've got bigger regions that respond to uh, lines of a particular orientation. But the same thing happens even if the animal doesn't see anything, if, even if it's uh, not exposed to light, you still have this kind of developmental trajectory. But then what happens is, uh, then if you don't see light, then effectively this pattern fades back. It kind of almost regresses. So it sets something up, and then it, if you don't get the inputs, then uh, it, it does that. So you can kind of develop uh, the brain, the visual brain, without light, but only to a certain point. And then if you don't get the proper kind of light source, then things can, uh, in this case, regress. And here you just see a more mature form uh, of that here. Um, okay. So here you've got, uh, again, a mixture of something that is innate, but is kind of expecting input from the environment. Um, language is another one where there isn't a huge uh, amount of evidence. So people had suggested that kind of adolescence is uh, kind of critical uh, uh, for language. Um, I, I think the, the, the problem with critical periods for, for language is that language isn't one faculty that, that's in, in our head. It kind of can be broken down into lots of things, so phonemes, words, concepts, and so on. And each of these may have different periods. So, for instance, the, the first year or two of life seems to be very important for learning the phonemes in your language, but things like your accent is quite fluid until about adolescence, of which it becomes fixed. Okay? Uh, so different aspects of language may have different time periods. There's the famous case study of Jeannie. So there's a child who's locked in a cupboard in Los Angeles until a, a teenager and so on who uh, wasn't spoken to and so on. And the question is whether or not she would develop normal language. Uh, and at one point, it was kind of used in favor of, well, actually, she could still acquire language later if she could to some extent, but it never became normal uh, language. What is the, the con more contemporary approach of this looks at second language learning. And the, the question you can ask here is, yeah. So wasn't it also found that she was actually also mentally retarded? Yes, exactly. So the problem there is that you can't look at language in isolation. So yes, exactly, the, the whole kind of intellect would be gone, and particularly with so screwed up social interactions, language is involved in communication anyway. So it's a question whether the problem is more to do with more basic cognition and so on, or, or diet and all the other things. Yeah, that's exactly right. The way in which you can kind of approach this, uh, uh, not with people who covers or whatever, it's to actually train people and see what difference uh, happens in the brain. So with second language learning, for instance, 
you could show that learning a second language effectively goes in the same network as um, your first language. And the interesting thing about this is that it doesn't matter when you learn your language, it goes in the same parts of the brain. So when you learn Spanish and so on, uh, it goes in there. And there are some parts of the brain that literally grow bigger the more uh, languages you learn. So you can look at people three or four languages, just as with the juggling study, uh, the people who learn multiple languages grow parts of their, uh, their brain that correlates with the number of languages that they uh, can speak. But it's not that they go into different parts of the network. You can establish them within the, the same network. Is there any research talking about, like, for example, you know, English and Spanish are similar languages in terms of uh, you know, construction of sentences and stuff yeah. like that? So when you learn a second language afterwards, you kind of also got a map of, your, of how you learn a first language to learn. Yes. Language. Is there any sort of research on people who learn two languages with, with different bases, like, say, uh, Mandarin and English in childhood? Yeah, it's um, yeah. I think what's interesting is the extent to which you've got different networks which are in the same place. They're kind of interleaved rather than being the same thing. So they look as if they're in the same place, but they're not. They're kind of separate networks that are like this. So in the same way, they've got two hands here, uh, but it looks uh, from the external thing as if they're kind of the same, unless you can go in at, at a fine level. Um, so with different kind of, so what's interesting is what how you kind of protect the two languages so you don't get them confused. Uh, which sounds like a very obvious thing to do. Uh, but from the brain's point of view, if they're in exactly the same network, why don't you start substituting words and so on? And that's an interesting thing. It suggests that there is some mechanism that kind of keeps them uh, separate. Uh, and uh, people have looked at that uh, and how it's switched. But I don't, I'm not sure if that's quite enough to your question. Young bilingual children do get mixed up to around seven. Is that right? Yeah, 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 yeah that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the, the way that people learn as an adult, adults, well, might be different. That they, so as they acquire the words, so they translate, say, Spanish into the English word and then get the meaning of the English word. So you go from your second language to your first language to the meaning. And then over time, basically, you've got meaning and the two language systems attached to, to that, if that makes any sense. And that, that's probably why children perhaps get confused and understand. I, I don't know. Yeah. But either way, it suggests. You know, in the, the, you know that, that certainly if you acquired one language, there isn't a critical period for acquiring a second language. Would be what one claim you can get out of this? <coughs> What's the mechanism for uh, sensitive periods? Well, one again, one idea is that this kind of mixture of nature and nurture. The idea that there's some genetic program synaptogenesis. This is creating a kind of synaptic network that the brain is kind of ready for learning, ready for learning language, ready for encountering faces and uh, seeing vision, that you're seeing things and so on. But then this becomes uh, less plastic afterwards. So once you've learned your language, then learning other ones straight away uh, can be harder or, or acquiring you know, uh, other attachments and so on. So it's almost as if the network becomes harder to change once something goes in there, uh, for instance. And then the question is, what kind of closes the, the sensitive window? And here, again, the question is whether or not that's predetermined or whether the environment itself, whether having an input, then kind of forces the network to effectively become more stable and, and, and kind of stop other uh, things coming in. Soon with language, the words you acquire early in life um, are more robust. And it's not just a word frequency effect. So things like doll and so on, which is not a frequent word uh, in adults. You, they, they still have a special status, you know. So when you when you start to atrophy in Alzheimer's and so on, all these young words uh, are still kind of uh, very secure in the network. So uh, so you do find it even with words. It's not the case that the first words stop new ones coming in, but there's an element of that that you can see. Um, yeah, there's also evidence here that, in, so this is in humans, so, um, so, so uh, some children kind of, it's almost as if it's a cataract, meaning that it stops them from getting light to the eyes, uh, but it doesn't switch off completely if you've got a cataract, there's kind of a window which you can operate on the child, then they will have normal vision. Uh, but eventually that window will kind of close, but the window kind of gets extended longer than it should do. Uh, if you will, it's almost like it's waiting for light uh, to come in before it uh, 
destabilizes. <coughs> the other kind of idea that people get uh, quite confused about when it comes to development and nature and nurture is this idea of nakedness. Um, and the reason is, is that people use it in at least two different ways, both of which are acceptable, by the way, but it's important to, to think about the way in which you, you're using it. So innateness could be used in the idea of it being uh, something that's instinctive or that's been uh, kind of selected by evolution. So innate in this sense of the word does not rule out a role for the environment. So, so Pinker uh, talks about the language instinct and language being innate. Now, but clearly, if you never meet another person, if you raise on a desert island, you probably won't have normal language, okay? Uh, and you won't have the words. So you learning your grammar, English, Chinese, and so on, you need an environment, okay? Uh, but the idea is that that behavior is still innate, it's still instinctive. So in this sense of the word, something can be innate, but it still requires the environment. You still need to see things. You still need the right inputs and so on. The way in which um, other people use the word innate, is this innate or, or whatever, is that it requires no environment. The brain can do everything without any support from the environment at all. And this meaning of the word is a lot more uh, controversial. So you need to think about you know, wh which one, which is the meaning that you're uh, ascribing uh, to it here. Um, So this would be an example of something that, that seems to be innate in the second sense of the word, and that it doesn't require an environment. But, but it, at least until 21 days, you, you don't need light in your environment. The brain will just kind of develop and tune itself into particular properties in the visual world without any vision. Uh, after 45 days, it's a different story. But the idea is that there is some kind of innate development in the brain that is completely independent of the environment but only up to a point in this case, only up to a point. Um, what about uh, likes and dislikes and, and, and so on? So again, there's a big literature on this, so I'm not really doing justice to it here. Uh, but again, some people argue that fear of snakes uh, is innate. Um, okay. Um, but, but what's been shown by this is that it, although it's innate, it still has to be socially learned. And this relates to more the first def definition of it being kind of instinctive, but with the role of the environment. Uh, so there's uh, a group of studies done by, I think it's Minica, looking at um, phobia recognition in, uh, in monkeys and primates and so on, and showing that kind of infant uh, uh, monkeys aren't instinctively uh, scared of snakes, okay? But what you find is that if you um, show the monkey a video of the mother or an adult with a snake and the mother's looking scared, then the, the, the infant can become, uh, uh, develop a phobia of the snake. The key thing about this is that you don't get the same mechanism with an object or a flower or something like this. So you show uh, the, the young uh, monkey a kind of flower with the mother going, or whatever you know, monkeys do, and they don't acquire the, uh, the same phobic thing. So it's not that the phobia itself is independent of the environment, it requires the environment. It's almost the preparedness, so it's often called uh, prepared learning, that they're prepared to learn that some things are phobic stimuli, but they're not phobic in and of themselves. They require uh, some kind of environmental cue to avoid them. So uh, a lot of bugs and snakes and so on, uh, kind of, it's almost that they have a tendency to, to acquire that, but they're not in themselves that. So, so again, here, it's that interesting kind of nature and nurture. And it's more consistent with this here, that it's kind of innate or an instinct to, to dislike them, but you still need the environment to tell you to dislike them uh, in that case. Yeah? Uh, taste preferences by uh, infants are another kind of example of something that's an innate light that doesn't seem to depend on the environment. Although here it could obviously be the environment in, um, uh, in utero, so infants can taste in utero, they taste the, the fluid that surrounds them, okay? uh, which does contain different nutrients. And so on. But anyway, they prefer sweet things over bitter and sour things, uh, for instance, and that seems to be quite 
you know, it's, you know, it's certainly not learned socially anyway. Uh, and there's, uh, again, a literature on human attachment. I won't go through. So, so yes, there, I, I think it is true to say that there are some things that, that are innate. It's a question of what are they and what do we really mean by innate? Is it an innate startup kit, but then you need the environment? Or is it something that really is uh, kind of in, in, innate in its own right and you don't need the environment at all? And those are two different ways of thinking about it. And this is also kind of well captured by, uh, by what's called behavioral genetics. So this is kind of trying to parse uh, uh, behavior and skills in terms of their genetic versus environment contribution. And again, the two kinds of methods here are twin studies in which you've got people who are genetically uh, um, well, two people who are genetically the same, so identical twins versus non-identical twins. And the idea is that non-identical twins have the same environment, identical twins have the same environment, but they differ on the genes. So here you would have sets of people, two uh, pairs of people who have the same environment but different genetic similarity. Here, adoption studies would be people who are genetically similar who have different environments. Okay. And, uh, so, so these are the kinds of methods uh, that have been used. So what they're trying to, to do with these uh, sort of things is to look how similar are identical and non-identical twins uh, uh, in order to uh, calculate how much of that is to do with the, the genetic similarity as opposed to non-genetic similarity, i.e. everything else. And, and you can partition that in terms of shared and non-shared environments, so things that are, are common to the set of twins versus the So that's a, a kind of interesting approach. I, I'll say some more about that. Later. And then adoption studies are, are effectively people who are genetically similar with different environments. So heritability is effectively the measure that you get out of these studies, that what you're looking at is how, what proportion of the variance can be explained by uh, the genetic similarity of twins or people in general as opposed to other things. That's effectively what uh, heritability is. So one of the key things I want to talk about here is the idea that it is to do with the variability in a trait rather than the actual value or the mean of a trait. And it's not the same as causation as well. So if the heritability value is 0.8, um, what well that means, you can't conclude that it's mainly caused by genes. What, it, what you can conclude is that 80% of the variability is, uh, is down to uh, genetic differences. Okay? So it could be that without, that you still need the other 20% in order to get the genes to work in the same way as you need the environment in order to switch on your visual cortex and other things. So it's not that the, that the genes are more important than that. It could be that that other 20% is just as important. It's just not contributing to variability in quite the same way. I'll go through some uh, uh, examples of that. The other thing about this is that it's, it's, quite, it's very culturally situated as well. And what this kind of means for, for us in kind of uh, Western, very educated societies is that heritability estimates tend to be very high, and they're a lot higher than they are in developing countries. And again, you think, well, that's puzzling, because they've surely got the same genes as us, and they do, but they have different environments from us. So one example here is that if you look at reading ability uh, amongst uh, Western kind of educated uh, people, what you find is that heritability estimates are very high. And what that means is that the variability in our different reading levels is uh, a lot to do with our genetic differences. Another way of saying that is that it can't be to do with our environmental differences, because our environmental differences are very homogeneous. We all get taught at a similar age. We're all required to achieve a certain standard, otherwise we get extra help and so on. But that will differ, say, if you go to a developing country, where your reading ability is as much to do with your, the wealth of your parents, whether or not you're working in a field, 
the opportunities you have and so on. And that doesn't mean that it's less genetic for them than it is for us. It just means that there's a whole other source of variance in their culture that we don't have in our culture because not going to school is not an option for us. Okay? Uh, but so, so again, you shouldn't treat this value as being the amount of uh, uh, genes, the amount which, uh, you know, it, it, it is genetic. It, it does have some meaning, but, but it's not quite that. Uh, the other thing is not to kind of uh, confuse variation with the actual trait itself or the actual amount of something. So a good example of this, and there's a book called uh, uh, Nature and Nurture by Matt Ridley, which is kind of a pop science book you can read on the train or something that covers a lot of these things. But one of his examples is uh, that the heritability of the number of fingers on your hand is a very low. Okay, and this seems completely puzzling because surely the heritability of the figures had this has to be down to your genetics and not your environment. Okay, and the key thing here is that the variation in the number of your fingers is more to do with the environment. It's about putting your fingers in machines and so on. Okay, so the number of fingers you have on your hand, 10 or a little bit less than 10, is due to your genes. The variability, why it deviates from 10 is not to do with your genes, it's to do with your environment. Okay, and this is a real kind of head puzzle for, for some people as well. Uh, as to, uh, you know, and you get this in other things. So why is everyone's intelligence improved? It means that intelligence isn't genetic. It, it, it can have a strong genetic component. It just means that you're sending more people to school, you're educating them for longer. Uh, and so it's the variability in that that you're accounting. So that's uh, another kind of thing uh, to bear in mind. So, uh, so although the number of fingers on your hand is pretty much entirely genetic, the, uh, the heritability of the number of fingers on your hand is low uh, because the variability is uh, caused by non-genetic things. Uh, and here, this is, you know, again, just the kinds of measures that you have. So ADHD is the inheritable here. Um, so it doesn't mean that uh, you know, it means that 70% of the variability in ADHD is uh, uh, due to genetic differences. Okay, okay. But you could take that in another culture and get a different value. Okay, so, so again, you've got this interesting interplay. It doesn't mean that the other 30% is not causal or not equally uh, as uh, relevant. So I won't get through all so how do you, what, what is a kind of a model for putting nature and nurture together? So this is quite a nice kind of overview paper. I, I don't know whether there's uh, more recent ones. Um, and it's kind of discussed mainly in the context of kind of uh, uh, mental health, really. But, but it applies to a lot of other things. It's just that there's been a huge amount of research effort into the nature and nurture of mental health rather than, say, you know, uh, general kind of cognitive skills. Uh, <coughs> so he, he talks about various kinds of uh, what he calls gene environment interplay, so um, how nature and nurture can interact with each other. Uh, and here these are just four uh, ways in which he, he kind of talks about um, uh, them. So the first one is the environment alters gene expression. So the, the key term here is called epigenetics. So uh, it's something that you, you, you may have come across, but it's something that is kind of a huge growth area, particularly in kind of uh, the life sciences. It's, uh, uh, what, what it means is that you're, although the code on, of your DNA doesn't change, you can attach certain things to that, so certain chemicals called methyl groups and so on, that affect the functioning of those genes. Uh, and this is just within a lifetime. It, it, supposedly, it doesn't get passed down, although there's controversial evidence it, it might do. So it, it, what it does is that you attach these little group, these little molecules to the um, uh, little compounds to your genetic code, and this affects it, its functionality uh, in, in effect. But the environment can do that. Uh, and there's evidence of this from, uh, for instance, in mice models, whether they've got a caring mother who kind of grooms the pups versus ones that uh, neglect them and so on. You can show that the genes get switched on 
in them and it affects the behavior of those animals. So that's one way in which gene and environments interact, is that your gene doesn't kind of give you necessarily the starting kit, it, the environment feeds all the way back down to the, uh, the genes as well. Um, heritability depends on the environment. So this is the point I've just uh, uh, gone through uh, now, that although the term heritability seems to be to do with genetics, uh, it's as much to do with how the environment uh, affects that. So, uh, you know, in agriculture, reading ability is very heritable because the environmental variation is low. In other countries, the amount of environmental variation is low, so the genetic variation uh, is high, so the amount of genetic variation is low. But it doesn't mean the genes aren't important. It just means it's not accounting uh, for the behavior in the same way more culture. So these are <laughs> examples here that, that I'll, I'll go through some concrete ones here. So what is a gene environment correlation? Uh, so the idea here is that your genetic disposition uh, forces you to go out and create certain environments. So some people may have genes that make them more likely to take risks, more likely to drive faster, to go on roller coasters and so on. And there is evidence for that, that there's certain kind of personality traits to do with extroversion and thrill-seeking that is kind of understudied in terms of genetic differences in, uh, you know, dopamine receptors and, and, and so on with this. Uh, um, also in terms of social interactions as well, there's uh, uh, a hormone called oxytocin which has different receptors and people who have one gene or the other would engage in certain kinds of behaviours. So it's almost as if your genes and your environment aren't two separate levels of description, that, uh, that your genetic makeup uh, influences your environment, uh, and your environment influences the way your genes are expressed. And it's not that you've got nature and nurture, you've really got nature and nurture working together here to create a, uh, an act. So that's a gene environment correlation where one thing kind of um, is associated with another. A gene environment interaction, I'll give you one example of that in the literature here, but what it basically would mean is that if you have a certain genetic uh, disposition and something happens to you in your environment, so something bad happens, you take a certain drug, then it might mean that you are then going to have a negative outcome. Whereas other people with a different uh, genetic makeup might take a drug and not have a ne negative outcome. So here, it's neither the environment nor the gene. It's about having a particular gene and a particular thing in the environment. Uh, so it's, it's the combination of the two. It's the interaction that you need a particular genetic variant and a particular, uh, a particular genetic variant and a particular environment. So, um, so here, these are kind of uh, examples of kind of cognitive neuroscience and, uh, uh, and genetics. So this is the KE family who uh, have problems in, um, uh, supposedly it was described as a problem in grammar. Uh, and what they w would do is that they would produce ungrammatical sentences such as this. And the idea was that this shows that grammar is innate, so there's kind of a grammar gene doing that. That's their family tree uh, of doing this. So you've got uh, effective and unaffected members. So what's uh, been found since is that although grammar's affected, lots of other things are affected. So copying mouth movements and other things are also... I don't... Which link are you looking for? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, oh. <coughs> there we go. Uh, so it's, it's, it's not a, a grammar gene. So, uh, so again, here there's a tendency to think, oh, certain behaviours are innate. But it, as soon as you test for a wide range of behaviours, you can show that actually it affects lots of other different things as well. And it seems to be to do with, um, with, to do with motor aspects of so the basal ganglia involved in uh, motor things as well. But you also find this gene... Um, express in other species. So canaries enables song learning. So canaries learn songs from listening to other birds. And this, uh, this gene is kind of involved in that process there. <coughs> so 
the point I want to make here is that <coughs> these single uh, genotypes, they don't just affect one simple part of behavior, they kind of affect uh, a broad spectrum of things. You're probably not going to have a gene for grammar, for instance. You might have a gene that affects grammar, but it's probably, if you look carefully, going to affect other things uh, in the brain, other circuits. So dyslexia is um, uh, an interesting one because dyslexia appears to be heritable. But as I mentioned last week, reading is essentially a cultural invention. So in the, in the sense of uh, innateness, we would not say that reading is an instinct, for instance. It's something that is, uh, you know, has to, to be taught. Language, in general, you could say is an instinct. So why is it kind of heritable if it's... Um, hi, is this room booked from 3 o'clock? Is this... Oh, this is... What is this? Cognitive neuroscience. Oh my gosh, one room, sorry. That's sorry. okay, I'm wondering whether the room isn't booked correctly. Enjoy, sorry about that. Okay, let me take this across there. Okay. Um, so the question here is that it seems to run in families, it seems to have a genetic component, but, but reading is a cultural invention. And they, the simple answer seems to be is that what's probably genetic is not a gene for reading, it's a gene for something else, such as to do with linking uh, vision with, uh, with spoken language, uh, uh, for instance, or to be, able to, um, to be able to read, you have to be able to divide spoken words into uh, phonemes. So to read a word like bat, you have to go uh, see the letter b and map it to the phoneme, but uh, then at to at and to, to, to and then blend them together uh, like this. <coughs> and what this means, as I mentioned last week, is that I in Italy dyslexia is not a problem uh, because the reading system uh, is easy to uh, uh, to learn uh, in effect. So what, uh, whereas in French and English, our reading system is, is quite hard uh, because the, the sound and the spellings don't correspond exactly. We've got lots of exceptions. So what Pat Lesu did is that he took in England and uh, France people with dyslexia. In Italy, because dyslexia doesn't exist, what he does is he took people at the bottom few percent of, uh, of reading re of speeds. Okay, so he would give them like non-words of things things to read which are unusual and show that they're at the bottom end of the reading distribution. It's just that their reading distribution is much better than ours, okay, because they've got a simpler system, but they don't have the same variable. The, the mean tendency is better, but they still have variability in their population. Okay. What you find is that um, uh, across all um, three people of, across all three cultures, di different reading systems, that in their brains you've effectively got a uh, hypo, so reduced activity by dyslexics in this kind of visual word form area and surrounding parts of a uh, kind of visual cortex to do with uh, recognizing these patterns uh, and maybe linking uh, vision to, to, to sound in all uh, uh, of these people. So. Um, this is a control task of just a reaction time to dot. And here, these are ones to do with reading, so reading words and reading non-words. And again, you can show that all three groups are kind of down on that, which they should be, and obviously it's done in their own language because they're dyslexic. But what they're also down on are lots of other things to do with spoken language. So spoonerism is uh, things like fuzzy duck, uh, ducky fuzz, for instance. <laughs> Uh, that people with dyslexia struggle to do that. Uh, okay, they're, they're kind of down by one standard deviation on that. So that's to do with manipulating uh, spoken language on this. But you find that even in Italians who don't have uh, dyslexia, a diagnosis of dyslexia, simply because their culture, uh, their language, their written language system does not enable uh, dyslexia to be uh, observed in quite the same way uh, as it is in ours and also for memorizing long strings of words, so kind of holding and working memory spoken words, they're impaired with that. So again, this is kind of uh, the idea that reading ability is, uh, or that reading is much more difficult in some cultures than in others, but within those cultures, you can show that you've got similar uh, kind of patterns, 
despite one being shifted up the scale and being much easier and better, um, the variability is still attributable to similar brain mechanisms. Right, so the last example I'll do is uh, to do with, with one from the Rutter study. And this is to do with uh, gene environment kind of interactions in uh, schizophrenia like symptoms. So what they have um, so, have you, have you come across uh, Dunedin studies before? Uh, is it really? And uh, so, the 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 reason why, uh, uh, so basically, uh, I guess it was about 25, 30 years ago, uh, New Zealand kind of had this cohort of about 10,000 uh, births, uh, 10,000 consecutive births, and effectively they followed these three people all the way through life. And they're looking at kind of environments, genes, their mental health, their cognitive abilities, and they get assessed every few years. So it's a longitudinal study of 10,000 people. And the other surprising thing is that people are very uh, kind of compliant about maintaining this. So people don't leave Dunedin, uh, they, they stay there. So they've still got like 99% of their original sample kind of uh, locus. <laughs> uh, they've, they've managed to keep the, this uh, group together. Uh, so, so it's a very important thing, so you can look who's kind of got schizophrenia in their, their 20s, and then you can look what was that person like when they were five, and it's not retrospective, you've actually got real data on what they were like when they were five, seven, eight, uh, or whatever. It's every two or three years they do this, and they've looked at pretty much everything uh, you can think of, physical health as well as medical health. Uh, so, so this is kind of, you know, a major uh, piece of worldwide research. So whenever you're interested in uh, uh, kind of nature nurture, have a look at what's going on in the Dunedin studies. Um, okay, there, there aren't so many of you here, so I'll, I'll kind of go through what they found. But basically what they looked at is this gene called COM-T, which is involved in uh, metabolizing dopamine. So there's this whole uh, dopamine uh, idea of um, <coughs> schizophrenia. And basically what you find is that um, this gene exists in two forms, one called MET and one called VAL. And this is just uh, a different kind of amino acid in the protein in the receptor. Um, so these are just normal genetic differences. So within this room there will be people with the MET allele, there will be people with the VAL allele, some with both. So because you always get one gene from your mother and one from your father, you may have two copies of one, uh, or two copies of the other, or one of each. Those are the three types you would have, and everybody in the room would fall into one of these categories, and we would probably be uh, mixed here. So what they look for is that here at age 26, they look for uh, symptoms related to schizophrenia. So it's not a clinical diagnosis although they've looked at that as well here. And what they, um, what they uh, do is that they've got everybody genotypes and they had a look whether between, um, I, I think, uh, 13 and 20, uh, or 13 and 18, they, uh, they were kind of uh, adolescent cannabis users, users in effect. Okay. What you find um, here is that having uh, the, the VAL genetic in, uh, variant makes you uh, more likely to have uh, these schizophrenic symptoms, but only in the presence of cannabis smoking. So having the val allele itself doesn't make you more likely to be schizophrenic. You're only more likely to have it if you have, well, again, the double dose in this one here. It's kind of curious that it goes down for these ones here. Um, it's not clear why no, no adult one would go uh, less with that. Um, so what does this, uh, uh, so, uh, the, the other thing about this is that they were actually asked as teenagers whether they were smoking cannabis, so it's not retrospective, it's not asking them at 26 what did you do when you were 15, they were actually asked 10 years previously uh, you know, what they were uh, taking uh, in, in effect, so they, they have reliable data. Um, the other interesting things that they've done with this is that they, they've taken it back to say age 11 and shown that some people who have the, the kind of schizophrenia symptoms report 
uh, at age 11 that the TV sends them special messages and things like this. Uh, again, it's not uniquely diagnostic, but you can show more than chance that children at the age of 11 who are more likely to develop these symptoms were reporting something quite unusual, uh, but not exceptionally unusual. There were plenty of children who didn't report those symptoms, but uh, it, it's pretty good. Uh, sorry, sorry, slide. What does this... Um, what, so this looks like um, a, a gene-environment interaction in the sense that smoking cannabis does not cause schizophrenia and having that gene does not cause schizophrenia. It's about having the two that increases the likelihood of, of, of them being uh, 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 together. Um, the other thing that was interesting is that you've got a gene-environment interaction, but you've also got a sensitive period. And what this means is that they looked at cannabis smoking after the age of 21 and showed that you don't get this pattern um, if you took a cannabis smoking act of 21. You only got it um, if you, uh, as an adolescent. So it suggests genes and environment and a sensitive period uh, there. So again, you've got this combination of factors. Uh, and again, it, it suggests, well, you know, is there a gene for schizophrenia? Obviously, there's lots of uh, genes that are linked to schizophrenia. Would you call this a gene for schizophrenia? Well, it's a bit of a missing, you know, it's not an accurate label in the same way as a gene for grammar would not be a, an accurate label. So it's not the gene that's causing it, but it's not the environment by itself. So maybe there aren't any genes for schizophrenia, there's just genes that do certain things in the brain. It's a complex uh, interaction. But it doesn't mean that genes are irrelevant, that you still need uh, both. The other thing that they could look at is that maybe have, maybe people with a certain genetic predisposition are more likely to try cannabis. If that was the case, that would be what's called the gene-environment correlation, that, that some people are, for whatever reason, more susceptible to peer influence, more susceptible to risk-taking, rule-breaking, whatever. That isn't the case, because again, they ask people at the time uh, what they did, and they can show that the different kind of genetic variants aren't linked to the actual trying of it. It's more linked to the, uh, the outcome or the amount taken. Any kind of questions or thoughts about that? So th there's other kind of evidence uh, with this as well. It's a bit of a controversial evidence to people who uh, people say, ah, but it's clearly not caused by cannabis. And that's perfectly true. It's clearly not. Uh, and, and the effects are small and, and so on. Uh, but I think the fact that it is such a complex story actually is what makes it interesting. So you could just conclude, well, schizophrenia is part nature, part nurture. Cannabis smoke doesn't really cause it, it may have a bit of an impact on some people. And that's effectively what this says, but it says it in a very interesting way. Did um, these people who um, presented with schizophrenic symptoms, did they not present until the age of 26, or, or uh, most of them presented during Oh, I see. Um, yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Um, because it could be that the Val Val um, genotype were cause schizophrenic symptoms from like during adolescence and they yeah the cannabis smoking was was an effect of the symptoms to calm them down as opposed to a thing that caused oh self-medicating yeah um yes i see okay that's yeah no, okay right i yeah that's a really good point i think that you might get that effect here that the what you would expect by your account is that th those who have that a little are more likely to, to try it or to use it more regularly. I think that that's what you would predict from your account. But, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, yeah, so, so the question of, yeah, 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 it's, um, there's probably, uh, there are other kind of influences, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, could it be self-medicated, could there be other things? One of the things that they don't do is that they don't repeat the same questionnaires. Although they test these people every three years, they don't give them the same battery. So I, I'm not sure that they were given the, the, uh, the kind of assessment for schizophrenia before that. But they were asked things relevant to it. So I, I, I'm not sure whether they were asked at a younger age about symptoms. But yes, it could be that they, there was something else that was key happening uh, at adolescence that is correlated with cannabis use but is not the cannabis use itself. That would be nothing. 
and you would probably get that out of kind of more animal models or other sorts of things. That, that that's where you can actually manipulate that experiment. Yeah, but, but yeah, that's right. So it could be the canvas is a marker for something else, but it's not the canvas. Yeah. 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 Yeah.